Welcome. This is the best ever brass music instrument makers podcast. Hi, I'm Jake. And I'm Matthias. Shalom, everybody. And it is the 27th of November, 2020. Friday. So, the customer's question of the week comes from little Timmy from Arkansas. And he wrote us, Dear Mr. Jake, I'm, my name is Timmy, I'm seven years old, and I play the trumpet in the band. When I grow up, I want to be a brass instrument maker, just like you. So how do you become a brass instrument maker? So first shout out to little Timmy in Arkansas. Appreciate you reaching out, little Timmy. You keep blowing that trumpet. <laughs> Man, what's wrong with these kids? I mean, Timmy, don't you watch the news? This plan is fucked once you get grown up. <laughs> There's no point anymore in fixing trumpets. You will be happy if you get some fresh water and clean air to breathe. <laughs> and with that positive note, little Timmy's question, how does one become a brass instrument maker? Um, we'll you better the- join Fridays for Future and skip school. <laughs> good kid, good kid. Yeah, back in my day, they told you how to study. Nowadays, they tell you, don't go to school, go protest. Uh, okay, little Timmy. Um, Matthias is comes from a German background. I come from an American background, so there's a slightly different systems there. Uh, just to explain the American system, I went to a technical college called Renton on the west coast, northwest near Seattle, Washington. In a di- uh, Renton, I believe is now a two-year course. I, when I was there, I think it was a three-year one. Haha, uh-huh, I have to actually look it up. Sadly, they shorten it. There are five schools in the U.S. where you can study wind instrument repair or making. Yeah, well, technically, there are like three, three state public schools. Public state schools, and then there are two private ones. Yeah. So, yeah. And just to go through, there's Renton in Seattle. There is um, uh, Red Wing uh, trade Minnesota. school in Minnesota. That's where the Red Wings come from. The shoe, the shoe company. That's right. Yeah. Uh, before they sold out. Uh, what w- oh God, what's the what's the other state school? Western Iowa. Western Iowa again. Thank you. Yeah, Western Iowa. In shout Sioux out Iowa. City. In Sioux City. That's right. Um, and then the private schools are Badger State Repair. Uh, oh God, where's Badger State Repair? I think it's in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah, in Wisconsin. In Elkhorn. Elkhorn. Ah, so near, near Getson, Holton, right? In Getson. Well, near Getson, places. right? Okay. Is there a connection with Getson or? There might be. Yeah. Maybe we can get them. It's like Mark and Kirkton. They're here on the cousin's th- mother's grandson. I think when you enter the the town, there's a little sign, <laughs> um, uh, Elkhorn, living in harmony. Oh my God, that's so cheesy. Good. <laughs> Fuck me. Right. Um, okay, so those are the schools. Um, there was also uh, one in Colorado. Um, for the life of me, um, I don't remember the name of it. It's a private school. If any of you out there has been to the school and knows what it is, write us. I don't. Can you remember the name of it? Uh, Something technical, whatever, I don't know. Yeah, okay, so you can see we really did our research for this podcast. Anyway, there's one in Colorado as well. So, hey, that was your part. Yeah, oh, that's right. Don't, I won't, <laughs> sorry, I'll take all the blame here. So, anyway, the way it works in the States, though, is um, when you first start, it is not so specific. When you go in, it, it includes all wind instruments. That means you have to do woodwind, so clarinets, flutes, saxophones, pick, um, um, uh, oboes, bassoons. In addition and they teach to you to instruments. manufacture all those instruments. Yeah, it's mostly it's mostly repair work. So you oh. learn you learn how to to overhaul instruments, mm. um, how to repad saxophones. Yeah, a lot I of thought this work. was about how to become a brass instrument maker. Well, they like all things. This is to like, get you started to get you dangerous enough. Basically, if you just want to work, uh, go to work at say Bach and make trumpets. I think you just go in there if they have a job there. I have no idea how they look for, for people to work there, actually. Mm-hmm. That that one is... Hola, habla uh, inglés. Sí, sí, I don't <laughs> think I can speak English in those factories anymore. <laughs> it's like anyone who's was at council before they closed this this year. Yeah, okay, let's stay focused here, sorry. So basically, uh, these schools are, most of them are two-year programs. And in addition to doing that, what I did was I also went, uh, like anyone in there uh, who wants to do this should do, you of course go visit the makers who are in the area, and I had the very good fortune to go to uh, Seattle, where there is a brass maker uh, workshop called Oberlo Woodwind and Brasswind, run by Dan Oberlo. Shout out to Oberlo Woodwind and Brasswind. Hey Dan. Yo, bro. So I did um, uh, my time there. I did a few years there, and along the way I supplemented it by going to meet a lot of other makers, 
it's not officially how you do it, but but you go around and you go meet you go meet a lot of people, get a lot of uh, different ideas, how to do this, how to do that. Before you know it, I'm in Berlin with my own workshop here, and that's been history ever since. So that's kind of the long short story from the American side. I don't know. We'll turn over to the German side. And yeah. <coughs> okay, little Timmy. Now listen, if you really really want to become a Brussels filmmaker, you better take some German classes, because actually. A lot of the special literature is written in German, and we have like a continuous tradition of over 500 years of masters training the apprentices and going on and on. Slave labor. <laughs> 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 I mean, we have some trade schools. Um, there's uh, one in south of Bavaria, one in Saxony, and one in near Stuttgart. And there's also in Switzerland uh, school and one in Vienna, but the way how you really learn the trade is that you look for a shop that is willing to take an apprentice and you make a contract with the shop owner for three years that you're gonna work for him for let's say little money how little is this little well back in the days it was back like in the, <laughs> in the first year 400 euros and then went up to 600 and I think from this year on, the government set a minimum wage of, I think, around 600. Wait, 600 per month or per year? Per month. Per month, okay. Euros. <laughs> so you work there full time. Then about a third of the of these three years, you would spend in school, where right. they will teach you about acoustics, about the history of the instrument. You get a little bit of work, workshop practice yeah. too, which is pretty cool since not every shop can teach you every aspect right. of the swim making this is just enough to get you a rough idea you you won't become a bell maker because you made a bell in school one time but at least you you've seen the process so it is far from being a perfect system but it's it is pretty much i think the best we got up to now yeah, I just want to also say a shout out to Rudolf Meinl, a uh, brass instrument manufacturer. As in, although I came from the U.S. system, I had made it a point when I moved to Germany to really go around and meet the German makers. And I just came unannounced to their factory years ago. And Rudolf Meinl Sr. was there, and he asked me, what the fuck do you want, of course, in Bavarian. And I said, uh, how do you make a tuba? And he's like, have you ever made a tuba before? I said, actually, no, I haven't. I've made parts, but not a complete horn. He's like, you want to learn how to make a tuba bell? I said, I would love to. So he spent the afternoon showing me how to make tuba bells. So pretty cool. Pretty yeah, cool. that was awesome. So yeah, Actually, yeah. if you want to take it to the next level, once you completed these three years, y you have no strings attached. I, I mean, the company, the shop can employ you or not. It's like a renegotiation after the three years. Yes, then, huh? yes. Mm -hmm. And actually, they can't even force you to stay. Uh, when the apprenticeship is over, it's over. Some just stay in the shop, some even for the rest of their career, but which isn't so likely to happen anymore. And some go and try to find work in, in the same area, but maybe in a shop that has a different focus so they can keep learning more stuff. And this is great to do while you're still young and not married, have no kid. So know. little Timmy, I hope that answers your question. Much love to Arkansas. So. At the best ever Brass Instrument Makers podcast, we get occasional literature from our colleagues and other shops around Germany. There is a company smack dab in the middle of Germany called FMB. Don't ask me what FMB stands for because I don't know, so... I know. It's a funky monkey business. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone knows what actually FMB stands for... No, it's a Fachmarkt für Blasinstrumente, I think so. Really? I yeah. Mean, funky monkey business is pretty cool. They should just, they should just keep that. <laughs> so anyway, um, for the Americans, the Yanks, who are listening to this, FMB is sort of like the equivalent of woodwind and brasswind in the middle of Indiana. So basically, you drive to the middle of nowhere in Germany, and there is this big shop that has an absolute butt. No, wait, it's not a big shop. It's a huge, huge shop. shop. That has an absolute buttload of br instruments, especially tubas. <laughs> and they sent us their Christmas catalog. Oh my god. I actually, it came with the uh, Sonic magazine. I it didn't come so. with that, did it? Yeah, yeah, it was inside of it. Oh, okay. So it wasn't even meant for us. No, this is just generic. Oh man, we're just gonna like anyhow just roast their thing here. Okay, anyway, as from one tuba shop to another, we want to help them out with their Christmas advertising. So they they have all these Christmas offers for 2020. Yeah. Um, and keep in mind, still the end of the year, we have reduced that in Germany. Yeah. So, so it's anyone buying anything <coughs> in Germany, normally our sales tax is 19 percent. They've reduced sales tax to 16 percent uh, to the end of this year. So you can actually save if you buy something expensive like a tuba, you can actually save quite a bit of money. 
Yeah, it's something okay. to consider. So, Jake, what, what do we got here? What is that? Um, so, I'm holding this catalog from FMB, from Funky Monkey Business. What did they put on the front page? I gotta say, they put a goddamn tuba right on the cover. Yeah, just as it should be. <laughs> very good, very and good. What kind of tuba is that? Oh, uh, let's see here. It is a St. Petersburg B-flat tuba, Bay tuba. It is a model 202LD45 MS GMS Premium. And premium. reading through all their sales literature here, all the large fancy words here, premium basically says that the valves... Also, for those who don't know, sorry, St. Petersburg tubas come from St. Petersburg. And if you happen to look on a map or on Google, you'll see that St. Petersburg is in Russia. It's a famous Russian company. However, the advertisement is premium is that the valves are made in Germany. Oh, wow. This tuba must cost a fortune, like 10 grand or so. Yeah, whatever. You can They can do their own advertising themselves. So anyway... <laughs> No, they no. have a tube on the front. Wait, wait. Want to okay, go ahead, man. They yeah. said for only 5,839 euros. Man, I, you know how much I paid for my St. Petersburg? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, admittedly, mine is like nickel plated. Yeah, is it a premium St. Petersburg? I think whatever premium, the opposite of premium is, that's the one that I have. <laughs> okay. So let's go on. What do you got? Okay, uh, so we were super impressed that they, put, that they put a tuba on the front page of their ad. However, the next page are recorders, block flutes. Uh, super fail, guys. Oh, wait, super wait, what fail. is that? A Petzard? Okay, Petzards are cool, but yeah. Uh, Sorry, block flutes. The only good sound that comes out of a block flute is when you burn it. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, next page, saxophones. Oh, no, Nobody gives a worse. shit about saxophones. It's even worse. Clarinets. Ugh. Good God. Okay. Ah, oh, now we're finally. Talking. By the fourth page in, we finally get to some real brass. We have trumpets. Uh, one interesting thing is there's an Adams flugelhorn, the F1, I guess like Formula 1, Formula 1. They have a flugelhorn that is a bell made out of different materials, uh, oh, nickel silver and a gold brass bell. Wait, how, how is that made? Mm. Oh, we talked about two-piece bells the other day, right? That's right. So, so mm. they make the stem out of the gold brass. gold brass, and then they take a disc of nickel silver, spin that puppy out to make the flare, and brace... The that flare to onto the, the gold, stem. yeah, brass part. So okay, so Adam Slugelhorn, that's kind of interesting. That's worth a Pretty look. Cool. All sorts Pretty of cool. other trumpets. They say like <laughs> were the first ones to come up with that oh. idea. Oh no, I might have seen it somewhere. Yeah, else. I wonder, right? Anyway, Olds uh, Studio. You all can Google that from the fifties. Yeah, Olds was ahead of their time. Reynolds trumpets. They all did this before. So Adams is obviously looking at the nineteen fifties. What do we get here? Ah, these are some valve oils, right? Ooh, the trumpet valve oil. You better get some valve oil to oil your valves. Remember we told you guys oil your goddamn valves. Okay, so moving on. Yeah. Next page are oh, trombones. trombones. Great, lots of trombones, great. lots of Christmas stars and snowflakes on there. Guys, I'm really sorry. This is an amazing catalog, but it could use something a bit more spicy on it. Like, like what? I don't know. I Some... mean, you know the old days they used to put boobs all over it? We know that's like not really allowed anymore, but... I mean, I didn't say it had to be a woman's boobs. It could be a guy's <laughs> boobs, too. But just could use something <laughs> a bit more interesting. Half-naked Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Santa stuff. Yeah, sure. Fatty, fatty Santa Shut with boobs. Shut man. That's cool. <laughs> so, fifth page, and sixth page in, they've got French horns, which oh, is well, only a tiny corner because we know nobody cares about French horns. But who makes these but French horns? Actually, we just want to say shout out to uh, the firm Jos Yosef, sorry, Lidl. They are Lidl back in business. <laughs> they are back in business again, and as we noticed by the F&B catalog, we see they have French horns and tubas available. So. Yeah, that's amazing. So, there's a bit of a story behind that, but we'll say hey, that for another podcast. Baritone, this looks so familiar to me. Yeah, we noticed that the Lidl baritone, it looks a lot like a Trevini baritone. A lot. A lot. <laughs> hmm, there is a strange connection there. Hmm. Hmm. All right, hmm. no comment, no comment, moving on. Tubas, woohoo! Okay, BNS selected edition tubas for only eight nine nine five. Not bad, not bad. Nine five. I mean, if you pay like nine grand on a tuba and you you save like three percent of that, that makes like that's actually a really good deal. Man. That's a cheap two hundred euros. Yeah, it even comes with a gig bag too. Holy oh, smokes! Not bad. Damn. Not bad. So it's a selected edition. I know it's been selected. Okay, there's we act, there's actually a reason for that. That's like their marketing there. They they have some guys who pick out this one model from BNS. Whatever. Okay, I don't care about that. Okay. There's a one model BNS F tuba that is uh, I think especially made for FMB. It's unusual in that it has a um, it's a mixture of gold brass and brass. I believe the bell is gold brass and the bottom bow is gold brass and the rest of the horn is yellow brass to give it a special sound. It comes with two lead pipes and yada 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 yada. Oh, and this wow. is called a selected oh, wow. edition. They can't call it the special edition anymore because Bethel has become somewhat of a slur in English, so it's the selected edition. So, okay. okay, looking at other tubas available, there is the Chinese-made ZOF travel tuba. It's called the Little Dragon, and if I please, guys in FMB, correct me if I'm wrong, but Little Dragon Xiao Long in Chinese is a euphemism for my penis. So, <laughs> just to avoid any mistranslations there, let me know if this is really a Xiao Long or if maybe there's a different dragon they're referring to here. So, <laughs> okay, in case of Saint Petersburg, selected, not Bethel. Premium, excuse me, premium. 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 Premium is too rich for your blood. There's the standard 45, which is the three five, which is three three and a half grand, I think. And then there's the gold brass one for four grand. Again, with the premium being at 5,800 mm -hmm. euros. Right. But I just want to say to Petersburg, I know everyone's going with the larger bells. They keep advertising it's a 45 cm bell. The earlier model had a 42 cm bell. I actually like the sound of the 42 cm bell, but everyone's going with these warmer sounding larger bells. Please bring back the 42 cm bell for us old farts, yeah, for the boomers. We miss those. 
Hmm. No, they're not. Those are cool, man. They're a bit more like little balloon folks. So, okay, so anyway. Wait, 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 there are also mutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Shout out to Folk Brass for their mutes. Um, they have a super. Actually, that's actually the best deal in the catalog. Folk Brass, the. No, I'm serious. It's a yeah. really good price. Huh. They have a mute for, for B flat tuba with a bag for, for 150 euros, or they have the practice mute for 313 euros. These are all FMB's prices, by the way. This has nothing to do with us. FMB, send your check to us now in the mail here, so we'll put our bank account number <laughs> at the end here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anything else to say about that? No, yeah, that's, that's a great uh, catalog. Great Christmas specials, man. If you don't know what to get for your beloved ones for Christmas, Buy them a tuba, or a French horn, or a trumpet, or a trombone, or whatever. So, anyway, thank you FMB for your highly entertaining catalog, but like we said, it needs more boobs, and it needs more tubas, and less woodwinds. Otherwise, great job though, guys. Okay. Moving on. So, if you decide that you don't want to buy a tuba from FMB, we have also a really awesome Christmas present. What is that one thing that you always wanted to get for your tuba, or to get for your friend's tuba, or your husband or your wife's tuba that they don't have. And we've got that. For those of you who own the Bolin and Fuchs tuben, the ones made before the Second World War, those nice pretty shields, nameplates on the front that are always missing after the restorations. Well, we are offering these in a very limited reproduction in nickel silver, and I guarantee you they- Selected edition. Selected. It's not special? Okay. I guarantee you these look and per perform is a fucking shield that doesn't perform, but it looks <laughs> like new. Like new, it's exactly an identical shield to what you would have had back in the 1920s or 30s. And this is the one thing that is very often missing on old restorated restorations or overhauls of tubas. So if you have a bone of folks tuba, especially the Kaiser or the four quarter model, and you're missing your nameplate, we are going to offer limited. I do mean limited. Uh, like limited to like. Ten thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I'm going to make a couple of them, and then I think after that I'm going to move on to doing better things with my life. I so mean, it's it's quite a quite some work. I mean, was we expensive. Had to, had to stamp machine out, and now we're going behind a powerful press. Did the first try with the hammer. It's pretty dangerous, people. Didn't yeah. work out so well, so. <laughs> We're still figuring out the process, but pretty sure by the end of the next week we're gonna have the first batch ready to go. So if you're interested, let us know. Like there's no better way to say I love you <laughs> than with a Boland and Fox tuba plate. So we are introducing a new section in our Best Ever Brothers and Makers podcast that is called Book of the Week. Just a little bit of story about this. Here in the shop we have a nice well-organized bookshelves loaded with special literature and it's like an open library. If you're in the area, you can stop by, pick up a book, take it home for a couple of weeks and just return it for free. And if you're having trouble finding any of those books, I could even ship it to you if you pay for the shipping and if I like you. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to present a couple of these books, like one once a week. The guy whose book I'm presenting, his name is Karl Nudel. With N, Nudel, like the pasta, he's a noodle. Rest in peace. And it's called Metallblatt Instrumentenbau. And this book and the author, they have quite an interesting story. I think I have to tell it. So Karl Nudel, he was born in 1875 to a certain Franz Nudel, who himself was a foreman at the Boland and Fox factory. Did you hear that? That was the sound of a hundred tuba players just creaming themselves because you just said Bolin and Fuchs. <laughs> Sorry. I need that plate. And the young Carl, he entered the trade with 14 years and did his apprenticeship there. But eventually after that, spent some time with Franz Schedewi in Ludwigsburg, another instrument maker at the time, and sometime in Budapest before he returned to Kvaslitz. Just to let you know, Kvaslitz is nowadays in the Czech Republic, but back in the day it was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, so there, there was a huge German-speaking population in that area. Well, he worked there and eventually became himself a foreman, and on the side he would teach at the local trade school, like um, drawing instruments, doing technical drawing and also um, practical uh, lessons. 
he eventually tried to establish himself as an independent maker but wasn't so quite successful worked uh, two or three other makers at the end he was employed at FX Hiller by the time the war ended and the all the German speaking population was driven out of the country and he emigrated to Austria finally established himself there and in 1954 his workshop got sold out to Musiker Steyr that's where the story ends I don't know which year he died but he apparently he kept a lot of documentation about instrument making and drawings and all these heritage was acquired by the Bavarian guild of brass instrument makers and in 1977 they summed up this material did a re revision by the leading instrument makers by the time and published a book which was attended as a textbook for the training of the new generation of brass instrument makers and this is a so-called metal bass instrument bow but this book has been out of print for a long time and if you eventually come across a copy probably you will have to pay arm and a leg <laughs> <laughs> i've seen one for 350 euros Jesus. on ebay a couple of years ago and it was gone in no time so uh. <laughs> we also contacted the publisher please can't you do a, a reprint but actually what would be nicer was to would be to go again through the original manuscript right. and do a a new edition since I think there are quite a few since 1977 what's changed to brass instrument making and there might be some incoherences but this doesn't rely exclusively on the responsibility of the publisher because the original manuscript is still with the brass ins instrument makers guild of southern Bavaria and a certain Walter Nuschel thinks has shout out Walter his hands we love your chimbasso on it and please Walter if you listen to us let's sit together and and discuss this project we would be very pleased to help um in any way to get this out there in some way to get a new edition and maybe make it bilingual English German since there is not so much text the main part being drawings so it wouldn't be too difficult to okay. and of course you could sell thousands of copies and make millions. millions and our instrument of the week or I should say instrument of the last three years <laughs> <sighs> I've been restoring over the past three years a Kaiser tuba made by the firm Bolin und Fuchs which is a really nice segue from all of the Bolin talk today just to try to decide I guess talk a little bit about the company first right and then I can go into the tuba bit. Two make as you wish yeah. since this okay. is the last point of the podcast good point okay i'll just talk about it's the company yours. yeah okay good um bolin and folks as most of you have clearly quickly realized is a company made up of two names meaning there were two people involved in the company from the beginning the first being mr gustav boland uh, he was born in 1825 in Graslitz. Um, yada 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 basically he he basically um, studied instrument making and then uh, like um, noodle what Matthias mentioned he traveled around the world uh, literally um, he went to Vienna Prague Salzburg Frankreich uh, sorry France Italy um, etc uh, meeting different instrument makers and he came in 1847 back to Graslitz and he tried to start his own workshop and the local guild was like bitch please you suck and he's like, oh, crap, they wouldn't let him do it. So he again went traveling. <laughs> wow. He did a sec. How many people do a second round, right? <laughs> he, he actually went around a second time and met other makers. Came back in 1849, uh, 1850, and uh, started his own shop. But it was only known as Bolin at that time. He was well known as being quite active in, in uh, local groups in his town. Uh, but especially what he was most famous for... Um, in Graslitz was also getting the music um, instrument maker school uh, up and running. The idea that you have a large school that um, 
trains the instrument makers separate from the from the from the actual factories in a sense giving them a certain stronger sense of independence than having them under the factory wing which was quite strange coming from someone who ran a huge factory but anyway he was the guy who was in charge of instrument design most of the designs uh, that came out bef before the 1880s were, were mostly his own work. He died in 1886, and before he died, he turned over the complete rights to the company to his colleague, uh, Martin Fuchs, probably because um, Bolin had four daughters, but he didn't have any sons to take over the factory. And I guess mm. the Austrians weren't progressive enough at that time to let a woman run a factory. So, boo! Unlike the French, say, uh, Besson, where the Marie was running the factory from, from the 1880s then. So anyway, so Bolin was in charge of design. His colleague Martin Fuchs was, was born in 1830, so he was five years younger. He was not an instrument maker. He was a bookman, we would say. He was the fixer, okay? Basically, he was the guy who made sure that the finances met, uh, that the, the, he dotted the I's, he crossed the T's. He was the one, interesting enough, who convinced Bolin to uh, install a, um, uh, what do you call this, 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 he was one of the very first factories in, in Austria to do this. They installed a large steam power plant within the factory. They were the first company oh, Russell wow. to do this, which enabled them to use power transfer throughout the factory. And this allowed then a huge, uh, um, how do you say, like mass production power to the instrument makers yeah right so so this was this was quite a, a huge upgrade compared to other companies and of course they a lot of them followed suit after this but uh, but Bolin and Fuchs uh, led the way with this but Fuchs was the one who pushed for this in the factory itself though as in he realized the potential of mass production yeah just uh, a little bit behind Martin Fuchs he was very involved in local politics towards the end of his life he was the 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 Burgomeister the mayor of Gruslitz Oh, wow. Um, he had to step down early, and then he shortly died after in 1893. He left the company then to his son, Johan, and then and then later the other son, Herman, joined the company. Just one question. Did he actually marry one of the daughters from his colleague? No. No. Nah. Bolin, uh, uh, Bolin's daughters, they, 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 they went on separately. And interesting enough, Bolin's family had nothing to do with the factory afterwards. Oh, they just kept the name for in honor of the original founder. Yeah, actually, it's maybe, I don't know, a sign of respect or because the name was well known. Mm. I suspect what the reason was is that the reason why the factory took off in the 1880s as it did is because Bolin had a very strong connection to Anton Dema in Wien, mm -hmm. and Wien gave them a lot of contracts. So right. basically, the factory in uh, in beginning... Maybe, maybe you have to explain to the listeners, mm. this is austrian Hungarian Empire we're still talking about, right? right? So 19th century. So Vienna was the capital of right. the uh, this huge empire, and Graslitz just a tiny town somewhere in the. That's right. Yeah. This on the outskirts. Yeah, it's like those out in the sticks. But you know? eventually, it became the center of uh, band instrument making. Yeah, actually woodwinds and uh, string instruments as well, though. Like and basically any kind of musical. By that time, yeah. there were so many bands and military bands. Quiet. They. Yeah, they could make millions. Actually, they did literally. <laughs> they so did make millions. Basically, though, Bolin and Fuchs, though, they, they got a number of contracts from these Adema, who was a big cheese instrument maker in Vienna, yada, 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 and they basically got a shitload of work from this, and this basically kept the company going for a long time. So you can imagine um, 1870 is when the company starts as Bolin and Fuchs. That's when the two of them came together. Uh, they had, at that time, 22 workers, and then you see then... Uh, 10, 15 years later, they had over 100, and then suddenly by the turn of the century, they had over 400 workers, if I read that correctly. Plus, probably by even by that time, wages were way lower than in the main Austrian territory. Yeah, that's, that's also true. And if you dig into the history a little bit with them, um, there were a number of strikes that happened in 1905 and then also 1907 among, interestingly enough, only brass instrument makers, and Bolin and Fuchs was involved in this, as and they were probably paying the workers like shit, and the workers rightfully so revolted, they came to an agreement, production carried on, but that, again, is for another podcast. But, okay, Actually, so... Actually, going back to Nudel, when he, when he was a teacher in the local trade school, there are some notes that the local instrument factories didn't like to s see him teaching those kids because they wanted just cheap labor for their sweatshop exactly. and not properly trained, skilled craftsmen. Exactly. 
Okay, so the factory stays in, um, in the hands of family Fuchs until the Second War happens, and then the last one, uh, Anton, right? Uh, Anton Fuchs, uh, he then flees to, to the West. Um, the Germans are expelled from Graslitz, uh, from Bohemia. Uh, Actually from all over Czechoslovakia then. What, what, there's basically two fold things that happen here. Basically the factory the, back in Graslitz is then rolled in together with a number of other companies. It becomes a combinat, a combination of companies, a state owned, it becomes under the name of Mati. Then you start to see a different class of instruments after the Second War. Uh, Anton Fuchs, though, however, he goes to Neustadt Eich, which might sound familiar to a lot of uh, modern brass instrument makers. We know this name. What's interesting is um, Mr. Fuchs, when he came there, uh, the, when he registered his business, there were two other people registered with him. There was a, a Josef Klia, and I, I forget also Josef also as well, but Hablovitz, and who then goes on to become the Bruno Tilts uh, uh, company. So basically the two famous, to this day, two famous West German mouthpiece makers, uh, Bruno Tilts and, and Joseph Klia, they were both involved with the last Fuchs before. And apparently uh, Anton Fuchs's business didn't last very long, I think a year or two later. The name is then suddenly deleted from the Handel's register um, and something there's something along the lines that the tooling in his workshop was then sold to another company. Ahuna was the company, so the saxophone oh, maker, okay. I believe, or the harmonic one. I mean, so actu actually, one fact aside, if you look at most of the nowadays uh, successful Bavarian brass and cement companies like Minor, Minor Schmidt, Bruno Tilts, Clear, I think so too, yeah. they all originated or were founded by refugees from right. German-speaking refugees from the Bohemian or even Moravian Lands. territories. Yeah, this is um, good, good to keep in mind. Interesting part of history, yeah. 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 So I think that's kind of in a nutshell the history of Bodum Fuchs. I just want to add my own opinion to this. In terms of history, time has not been very kind to Bodum Fuchs's designs. I would say that a good 90% of their instruments looking at modern eyes are absolute garbage. They were a mass production, very cheap instruments. So for example, in terms of piston valve trumpets, if you were to compare say a Besson from France, one of their professional trumpets against a professional Poland trumpet, no comparison, the, f the Frenchies would blow that out of the water. If you were to compare their copy of a German rotary trumpet to that of Heckel uh, from Dresden, again, no comparison. However, having said that, that most of their stuff was crap, they did have one design of instrument that has survived the test of time and has, has become, um, in terms of a modern instrument, also very highly sought after, and that is the Bone and Fuchs Kaiser tubas oh. in B flat. Oh. Oh. Or the Bolin and Fuchs, also the, the four quarter B flats, or to a lesser degree, the four quarter C tubas, which are all equally very, very good. Yeah, I heard that too. Um, every time you say Bolin and Fuchs, an angel gets their wings. It's the Christmas season, people, get with it. Um, so, okay, so very often in the workshop here we see a lot of Bolton Fuchs Kaiser tubas. However, the vast majority of them, um, yeah, we can talk about why those things are famous for another reason, but the vast majority were made be between, I would say, 1900 to, to 1941, 42, some of the latest ones. Because then they had to swap to wall production, right? Yeah, that was the end of them. They turned into, they were making, um, I think, casings for, for machine guns, shells. Oh, yeah, man. So. Um, Did they use some forced labor, maybe? Possibly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that, could that be a reason why the Czechs were not so fond of the Germans <laughs> anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Next podcast. Um, anyway, so, long story short. Uh, I was called about three years ago by a very kind customer of mine. He has a Bonum Fuchs Kaiser tuba he would like to have he would like to have overhauled and used in a modern or a modern setting in wind band and orchestra. Unlike the rest of these Bolin Fuchs Kaisers that I see, this one that landed on my table is perhaps one of the earliest, if not the oldest, I have ever seen. Uh, so we know from patents that Trevaney invented the Kaiser tuba, invented, well, came up with the Kaiser tuba in 1883, 84 is their patent. Having had the luck to measure one of those, this particular Bolin is a very close copy of that very first Trevaney. And this Bolin does not look anything like any of those later Bolin and Fuchs Kaisers. So this, just as a historical instrument, is in itself extremely rare. It's been I, what I would call one of the most difficult projects uh, I've had on my table ever. Ever? 
and I think for me what has been the most difficult thing um, in this restoration is that from the original construction process and also the amount of time and, and damage that's happened to it. Okay, so the tuba was made around probably 1885. Unlike most other tubas from this time, we actually kind of have an idea when it was made, when it was from, because it's very clearly stamped on the instrument that it was used in Freiburg and Breslau in the opera. Oh, wow. So it, this tuba actually has a history to it, which makes it even sexier, honestly, which is super cool. Yeah. Super cool. So this tuba has ser played some serious shit, man. So this tuba has probably played, for example, Wagner operas w about when they were still new and people had just heard them. So wow. And that self is pretty awesome. However, 130 years later, it's had the living shit kicked out of it. It's had a number of poor repairs and so on. So turning back the clock, trying to make it into a usable modern instrument has not been an easy task. But I will, just to keep it short here, to say one of the most difficult aspects of restoring this instrument has been the outer bows. So, for example, the bottom bow, because this is a brass makers podcast, so we're going to talk about some brass making Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Yeah. See, you can hear the dog, even she agrees. Uh, when this tuba was made new, the bottom bow, for example, unlike um, a lot of other bottom bow techniques, it's actually made out of a, a single cone that has been filled with a sheet. It's not a two piece one, it's a one piece bottom bow that has been filled with lead Holy and shit. bent. Man, how. how heavy must that have been i was just gonna preface it by saying i can't imagine how fucking strong those guys were who worked there so if you went back in time 120 years and you saw a bone folks guy from the tuba okay. department you better not piss that bro off because he they, the they, they lived on a diet based on bohemian knuddles <laughs> and <laughs> some bohemian bock beer yeah the way it was made, though, is that this was bent over a form. The outer waves were hammered down, the deformations of the brass, and then it was filed off, lead melted out, polished, yada, yada, yada. However, those sons of bitches in the factory at that time, they didn't exactly take all the waves out, did they? They just <laughs> filed it off of the outside. Filed it out. And they left the dents on the inside for me to find 130 years later. So when you de-dent the horn, all those old dents come running out with a vengeance, including oh, all the old man. hammer marks. So <laughs> what should normally be a, a month or two job turns up into ends up into a oh my god year long process. So I just want to say thank God I'm almost finished with it now. It is really approaching the end. I am so happy to get it back into its very patient owner's hands, and <laughs> I really can't wait to hear what it sounds like in context. So it just looking at it, you know, this thing already sounds awesome. Just uh, how do you say spoiler alert? I actually tried it. Right. Uh, I taped it together early, and it sounds amazing. You're putting a modern day wild flock. That's the one of the we decided in the end. Okay, we want to. This is going to be used for modern use. Yeah. So although yeah. it is possible to rebuild the original valves, it is probably unlikely you can get them to the point where it would perform on par with a modern machine. Mm. Mm. So we decided to use a modern five valve Meinl Schmidt block. The original was four, but we want five because the owner again he says he wants bit more fingering uh, options in the low range i completely understand if you're playing a brass band that that mm -hmm. is a probably a very good call well, sh just one quick question did uh, the original factory had their own bulk making department yes they did yes they did okay otherwise you could argument okay i mean minor schmidt was a company active in Kresslitz. it's so it's highly likely that the guys from Mano Schmidt at that time, they might have actually studied with the guys at Bono. They might have worked there originally. And so I suspect Mano Schmidt probably paid them a bit better. They were a much smaller company. But having said that, Bolin and Fuchs not only made instruments, they made components for a lot of other makers. So right. you can see Bolin and Fuchs valves in a lot yeah. of other tubas from yeah. that time. So they were like basically the BNS of their time. Even bigger. Yeah. But even more crazy. And I just want to say one other thing. The original Bolin valves, they look really cool. But to be honest, if you take them apart, just also want to say that the valves of Bolins, um, although this one are quite okay, when you get in the 1920s, 1930s, their valves honestly look like a fucking corn cob uh, in terms of tolerances. And I'm not just talking worn out old shitty valves. Uh, even ones that I actually saw a, a, a new NOS, a new old stock Bolin valve block that was from the 1920s that had never been used. I took it apart and it looked like someone Honestly, it looked like a fucking hamster chewed its way through that thing. It was all <laughs> a beaver, sorry. One of those one of those animals that has, like, sharp teeth. So I don't have a huge problem with, uh, I know it's in terms of being very correct, like the original parts, but I in this restoration, I don't have a problem with using the modern valve block with this one. 
But the original one had such a nice engraving on the valve caps. I know, but the owner, because he's so awesome, he actually let us spring for redoing the engraving on, on the new valve cap. So oh, it's gonna that's so cool. It's going to look awesome. So shout out to our friend. She's in Weimar, right? Yeah, Stephanie. No, I think she's... Or Thuringer. She's very close to Weimar, I thought. Sachsen-Anhalt. Yeah, I haven't been in her workshop personally, but her work speaks for itself. So when it comes back, we're going to show you guys. It should be back the next few days. We'll have some pretty awesome pictures to show you guys. So we're pretty yeah, stoked about that. There's this chick. She's trained in hand engraving. Chick? There's Lady? She, she th There's a, a trade school in Zul uh, where you can train uh, weapon making and weapon engraving. And she comes from that school. And she also has a side business engraving uh, musical instruments. So if you need a traditionally made hand engraving, shout out to Otilia. Honestly, the original bow and engraving, although it looks nice in pictures when you see it in person, yeah, it, it's a little bit, man sagt auf Deutsch, grope. It's a bit rough around the edges. And we, you know, we're giving this to a real meister here, and we think she's gonna, you know, make it a little bit more precise, a little bit finer. Mm -hmm. And she's still doing it all by hand. She actually will chisel it out just like they did in the old days. So no computers here. So cool. Yeah. So the restoration has been uh, very long and arduous, and has, I think, I have a lot more white hairs from it than I ever had. I don't know if I will ever do another one like this again. Um, part of me hopes not. Part of me hopes, well, maybe, we'll see. But. Um, I'm very excited to be finishing this up very soon, and and um, we'll see what comes after that. But anyway, I believe that is the podcast. Thank you, everyone. Uh, any last words, Matthias? No, I think we're going to just play another Christmas tune and wish you a nice week, and see you next week. Okay, sounds good. All right. Thank you, everybody. That was the podcast. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.